The State of Crypto is presented by Tron, connecting the world to the power of cryptocurrency. All right, joining us now for more analysis is Ava Labs President John Wu. Welcome to the show, John. Hi, Jen. Hi, Lawrence. How are you? Hey, how are you? All right. Now you heard the top of our show first, before we dive into um, what we're going to talk to you about today, we want to get your reaction on yet the next, uh, yet another DeFi exploit with Curve. Yeah, it's a very unfortunate it's a, a setback for the space. Um, and it's never a dull moment. Even yesterday on Sunday, when I first heard of it, I started reading about it. And you both have done a great job of um, talking about exactly what happened and the story is still unfolding so we will ultimately see but i think there's a couple of things we can um, take away from this like with all systems that require code there are mistakes um, sometimes a human sometimes it's in the the programming itself and this is not the first time so it really highlights the need for better security audits perhaps oversight and hopefully one day, maybe um, even artificial intelligence can be used to more efficiently review the contracts and make it uh, more secure. I was just going to ask, I mean, are, are, you know, does this bring up the, the whole, you know, now we have this whole AI boom happening and and all this excitement around it, that this is a, a prime opportunity before these things are, are brought into the into the wild that, uh, you know, we can have something that would, uh, you know, like almost a, an audit system that would grade the code and say it's been checked uh, by AI for exploits? Well, more than just grade. Yes, that's a great idea, Lawrence. Uh, more than just grade, but you know, AI can actually do things a lot faster and iterate and continue to, you know, test the code and can, um, as generative AI does, it can learn from itself. So ultimately, I think it could be used as a tool to bring more security and fewer exploits to the space, which is super important because, I mean, ultimately what Curve is used for is for predictable and stable lending and borrowing. This is why Curve exists. And it's so needed in DeFi so assets can move around. Um, you know, this is also, I think, part of the reason why, you know, some of the initiatives that Ava Labs is doing with real world assets, tokenizing, traditional assets like uh, private equity or foreign exchange or uh, commodities or real estate, they are far more stable um, in terms of asset pricing. So they could also be used to solve this problem in terms of making it more predictable and stable for lending and borrowing in the ecosystem. So John, you, you, you did the transition for us uh, into kind of what you guys are doing here with tokenizing. And I have to ask here because we, of course, have an SEC that has made it clear that they're going to scrutinize crypto, that they that for the most part, anything that's not Bitcoin is a um, is a security jury still out on ETH as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I don't know how they'll eventually take it. Um, and to be to be honest, I'm not sure about Bitcoin some days. But um, how how will this uh, as you tokenize real world assets, how do you see that being uh, traded when it seems that the SEC views things, uh, you know, is going to say, look, these are securities. Obviously, and especially if you have tokens that are backed by securities, therefore, it needs to follow regulation. How do you do it in a decentralized manner when you have a, a, when you have a, a, a regulator that says we want to be at the center, essentially overseeing all these all these trading uh, actions? So that's a great question. And there's a lot in that. Obviously, it was a long question. Um, Sorry. No, it's great. I mean, and we have to uncover. You're not the first person to tell me. I, I tell. Long, I ask long <laughs> questions. So, I mean, tokenization of real world assets. You know, the tokenization part is really a wrapper for the underlying asset. Whatever the asset is, whether it is a security, a, uh, a commodity, um, a, a painting. What the tokenization does is it's a wrapper for the right of ownership and it's in a blockchain. You know, think about it. There was a time when ownership was represented via paper and then it had to be digital. 
And now this is just a different type of wrapper for representing the ownership. So that's a distinct difference. Um, and from the previous court case, uh, at least, you know, the district uh, result from Ripple, um, they came out and said there's a difference between the underlying asset and the way it's transacted. So if you're going to wrap that asset in a tokenized version uh, and put it on a blockchain, you still have to use the proper uh, licenses and regulations and, and use the right methods that that particular asset type would need in order to uh, transfer just like it does in other forms uh, when it's wrapped in just zero and ones or by uh, paper to represent the the underlying value of the asset. John, you you brought up Ripple there. How are you, you know, Ava is a U.S.-based company. How are you looking at the partial win that Ripple uh, received over the SEC? How's the rest of your company looking at that as you continue to build your business in the U.S.? I mean, there's been so much said by so many people. I won't repeat any of that, but I think the big takeaways are it brings more clarity, which is great, but it's not conclusive and there's a long road. And um, I think what it did do was provide a catalyst uh, for Congress. And it's not coincidental that just in the last week or two, you've seen so many bills being pushed or moved and voted on to help uh, regulate and bring clarity in a comprehensive way to the space. So from that perspective, initializing or catalyzing Congress to, to get involved is a good thing. So uh, getting back a little bit to asset tokenization here, uh, how, how do you see it ultimately though, uh, for, for the consumer at least? I mean, like it's one thing when it's institutions buying and selling these uh, tokenized assets. Uh, but do you see, how do you see consumers purchasing and, and selling their, their tokenized assets? Do you see them on, you know, going on uh, Coinbase, for instance, and, and doing it that way? Or do you see it, uh, uh, private DeFi versions of it, if you will? Or, you know, or, or would it require creation of new institutions to, to make it happen? So let's go through the benefits of tokenization, and then we can answer that question um, after we go back to first principles. You know, Basically, the tokenization, if you broadly speak, brings value in terms of creating more liquidity, providing better access for individuals, and obviously it provides a lot of efficiency. And that efficiency in the code or in the automation of the workflow or the way things are saved saves a lot of money, a lot of cost. The efficiency benefit is being seen today. You've got JP Morgan doing JP Morgan Guardian. Um, you have Canton, which is the uh, project with Goldman Sachs and a whole bunch of others. You also have um, Ava Labs, how KKR tokenize a sliver of their um, healthcare fund so they can provide more access to accredited or qualified investors. So the efficiency side, I think, is becoming clear to the institutions. The access side is just starting to happen. It's going to first happen to accredited and qualified. Um, but ultimately, the thing that they need to make to get the most benefit of tokenization is liquidity. And that liquidity will happen with um, current players such as Securitize that have the, uh, the broker deal licenses and have the right ATS and have the necessary, uh, call it compliance, um, in order to transact that. Now, the issue is from a commercial perspective and awareness and adoption of that is still lagging. So this is why the foundation of Avalanche has um, basically initialized with this um, VISTA program to, to basically help uh, create lubrication and so that the places with the proper licenses can have some liquidity for the new people that access these hard to find tokenized assets. John, you're doing all the transitions for us this morning. It's such a you're just such a great guest to have on a Monday morning. Tell us more about your new initiative that you just mentioned, Avalanche Vista. So Avalanche Vista is um, from the foundation, and it's a $50 million effort for basically once uh, uh, institutions, whether that be banks or asset managers, could be, for example, the KKR uh, situation, has agreed to tokenize, you know, just like a uh, traditional bank in, in the regular um, TradFi world, uh, you know, takes um, the initiative to have green shoes or other things to, to make sure that there is 
uh, call it demand for it. That's really what it's there for. Um, it's not there for necessarily to, to hold them if they can, you know, just provide that initial liquidity and allow places like, you know, again, with licenses like Securitize to affect the secondary transaction, you know, they, that is the purpose of Vista. And um, I think to support these project launches with liquidity, but also Ava Labs will support it with help integrating uh, into a sub network or helping them grow and learn the benefits of tokenization, such as, you know, what we did with Spruce and T. Rowe, Wellington and Wisdom Tree, where they effectively have an institutional um, DeFi ecosystem to tokenize whatever assets they desire. John, before we go, I got to ask you about the metaverse. I know you're a big supporter of the metaverse and Web3 gaming. Given Meta's recent report that they lost billions of dollars on their metaverse division, we've seen Yuga Labs uh, not really publicly launch their other side metaverse yet. What's your outlook on that? Are you still bullish? How's your partnership with Alibaba going? Well, thank you for asking that. Um, we're very excited about partnership with Alibaba. Um, you know, we have to remember that each um, the metaverse is defined differently by different people, different companies, and different regions of the world. A lot of metaverse is associated with uh, real estate, virtual real estate. Others are associated, associated with a background for gaming. Um, one thing is for sure, if you look at gaming as a proxy, um, there are about 3 billion gamers in, in the world. One and a half of those are in Asia, and Alibaba uh, is trying to create a metaverse where it's there is a virtual real estate component, but also makes it fun and there's a gaming aspect to it. And um, I think we're very bullish on that aspect of it. How it's properly defined going forward, I think it's going to evolve. And ultimately, you know, it's a digital world. Uh, my kids play in. Uh, effectively a metaverse called Roblox all the time. So I think we're going to move towards that. So depending on how you define metaverse, um, we are going to move to a world. We're just going to be more online than we were before, especially the younger generation. I got to ask you a quick follow up here. Are, is anyone using it? I know you're, you're helping to enable businesses get into the metaverse. Are they actually doing this or given the market, given what they're seeing happen with more mainstream companies like Meta, are they kind of just staying on, on the back burner waiting to see it, what happens? It is beginning. Um, I, I can't say it is, you know, so uh, abundant that you turn and, or you go somewhere online and you can just find places to go. But, it, you know, people are experimenting, understanding the value and how companies can create incremental revenue for themselves and how users um, can find great uh, entertainment, if you will. I think it's very, very much in the early stages, but things are happening. All right, John, thanks very much for joining the show this morning. Thank you. Yeah. That was Ava Labs president John Wu.